Welcome to the next talk in the GPU series for statisticians. Today I'm going to be talking about the QRAND library in CUDA. This is actually a redo of a video screencast that I did a year ago. So much of the information I'm going to talk about is very likely outdated, but I want to be consistent with the things that I did a year ago. So I'm going to stick with what I already have in the slides. The QRAND library has a host interface and a device interface. I'm going to go over both. Then I'm going to go over a rejection sampling example on the GPU because statisticians like rejection sampling. And for those of you who aren't statisticians, I'll try to explain it in an accessible way, though. Anyway, QRAND, here's an overview. So with QRAND, you can generate pseudorandom and quasi-random numbers. A pseudorandom sequence is a sequence of numbers generated by some deterministic algorithm. So random numbers generated by a computer aren't actually random. They appear to be random when we, when we check them for certain metrics of randomness, but really it's just a deterministic sequence. They're, the random numbers are, are fake, they're not actually random. And the random number generator is a sequence of these random numbers, either pseudorandom or quasi-random, which is like a pseudorandom sequence, except that there are some modifications to make these random draws appear to randomly fill in some n-dimensional space evenly. So, here are the two APIs, some basic facts, I guess. So, when you're writing CUDA code for the host API, you've got to include this header at the top and the appropriate flag at compilation. All your calls to number generators happen on the host, so you don't need to write any kernel calls. So, what that means, you have to know how many random numbers you need to draw to begin with. So you, you can't dynamically calculate the number of random numbers you need and then do that on the fly uh, as easily. So, and it supports a few pseudorandom and quasi-random number generators that I'll come back to. The device API, on the other hand, you need this kernel header and calls to these generators happen within kernels and device functions. So you will need to write your own kernels in order to use this, but you have a library of random number generators that you can use inside these kernels without having to write yourself if you want to draw random numbers in parallel and micromanage how that happens. And it's useful because you can more easily generate random numbers on a need to know basis in real time. And we'll see how that's useful in rejection sampling because in rejection sampling you may not know how many random numbers you need to generate beforehand. You may only know that you're going to stop the algorithm when the stopping time actually comes. So in that situation, in similar situations, the device API is often more useful than the host. So unfortunately the, the device API supports fewer generator algorithm, algorithms in the version of QRAND that comes with CUDA version 4.2. At the time I did this, I was using CUDA 4.2. I know that's a very old version at this point, but I'm using 4.2 just to be consistent with what I did a year ago. So the host interface, here's the breakdown of your workflow. So you, you create a generator, you set the generator seed, that, determine, that tells the generator what starting point it should use among other things. You need to allocate the memory yourself for the random numbers on both the host and the device. So even if, though you're not using kernel calls, you need to allocate this memory on the host and the device yourself. You call a function that actually uses the number generator to generate these things, and then you clean up the generator with a special function, QRAND destroy generator, and then you free everything else with free and CUDA free like I had talked about before. Now, 
you have different number generator types. And depending on the algorithm you want to use to generate these pseudorandom numbers, you pass different macros to current create generator. And here are your options. So these things in caps and with underscores are just macros that you pass into this function up here, Kuren create generator. You have the XOR wow. Algorithm is your default. You have multiple recursive family. And you have the Mersenne twister. Now the Mersenne twister is the currently the gold standard for random number pseudo-random number generation in languages like the R language for statisticians. It's a very good pseudo-random number generator and if you, given these choices, I recommend the Mersenne Twister. And given most sets of choices, the Mersenne Twister is, is excellent. Um, Quasi-random number generators, you have Sobol and scrambled Sobol in 32 and 64 bits. So gener other generator options that you can specify are the seed, when you're initializing a random number generator, you need to specify the seed, which says where to start the sequence. It helps calculate the starting state. Because really, a random number generator is just a sequence, of, a pseudo-random number generator is just a sequence of numbers. And you, as you generate more random number, pseudo-random numbers, you step through that sequence, and the seed tells you where to start. And as you move along the sequence, you keep generating pseudorandom numbers, you keep track of that starting state. Optionally, when you step through that sequence, you can skip numbers along the way in that sequence. And so you can do that by specifying the offset, which is the number of pseudorandom numbers to skip at each sequence. I don't know why it's not available for the Mersenne Twister, but that's that was written in the documentation. So and you can specify how these results are ordered in global memory if you choose to program it at that lower level. And you have different functions for generating um, random bits, or standard uniform draws, or normal draws. And these have options for float and double precision, and you have a log normal option as well. So here's an example. So we just want to generate 10 pseudo-random floats. I allocate some host data and dev data, those are going to store the, the pseudo-random numbers. I create the generator, it's a Mersenne Twister. I set the seed, I generate some uniforms that are stored on the device. I copy those back to the host, and I print them out and clean everything up. And that's all there is to it, that's all there is to the host API. Um, you can you can tweak some things, but that's most of what you need to know. And just to show you that it works, I compiled this and ran it. Here are my draws. They're, on, they're uniform in numbers. It should be a flat histogram if you plot those. And again, in the compilation, you need this lqrand flag to link with the qrand library. And this source file and this code are available on the website for the series. Device interface. It's a bit harder to use, but again, it's a bit more flexible. It allows you to micromanage more things. You take care of the parallelism. You can run this thing even though you don't know how many random numbers you're going to need. And it just gives you a bit more control. Usage is a bit more complicated. Um, typically, you're not just going to use one random number generator you're going to want to generate random numbers in parallel and to do that for the device interface you're going to need to initialize hundreds of thousands or, or tens of thousands or thousands of uh, random number generators simultaneously or you, you need to keep track of thousands of random number generators and you're going to typically run those in parallel if you want to do this really fast um, or you're going to have random number generators that are part of a parallel process. And if you're doing multiple things, multiple threads in parallel, um, and you get to a point where you need to generate random numbers, each of those separate threads should have its own random number generator. If, you're, if multiple concurrent threads try to use the same random number generator, you run into trouble really fast. So each thread in 
and your algorithm and your procedure should have its own random number generator. And you initialize all of them with current in it, and then you keep track of all the states. And I'm going to show that in an example. When you actually want the random draws, you use the functions current or current uniform or current rand normal, which are exactly what they sound like. But I'll have a slide that lists them and their arguments. And you can generate pseudorandom or quasi random numbers as needed. There aren't as many random number generator types. So you have the XR wow for pseudorandom. I'm disappointed that they didn't have a Mercene twister that may be fixed um, soon, hopefully. And you have Sobol for quasi-random option. And here's a list of functions with their parameters. This is for the X or wow, the pseudo-random number generators. If you want a, a quasi-random sequence, then these arguments to current and nit are going to change, and the state that you pass current and nit is going to have a different data type than here. Well, you have a bunch of options for generating from various distributions here. I'm not going to go over them all. And you had these, but I will say that this 2 at the end of this, so current normal 2 generates a pair of normals instead of just a single normal. That's what, that's what that means. And these are device functions now, not host functions. Again, with a SOBOL, if you want to generate a SOBOL sequence, you pass in different arguments to current init. Current init is overloaded, so it understands these different arguments. So here's an example. I want to generate a bunch of pseudo-random numbers in parallel, parallel, and uh, count the number that are odd. And here's how I'm going to do it. There's a kernel to set up these random number generators. Since I'm doing this in parallel, I want, again, each thread to have its own random number generator. If you try, if multiple concurrent threads try to sample from the same random number generator, you generate a race condition and that's really bad and really hard to diagnose. Especially because we're doing, we're adding an extra element of randomness on top of the randomness inherent in a race condition. You have random number generation on top of that. These race conditions that you would generate by using a single random number generator for all of your threads would be even harder to diagnose. So you'd better make sure that each thread has its own random number generator. And you do that by passing in to the setup kernel an array of states, one for each random number generator, and each thread takes, a, takes one of these states and initializes the corresponding random number generator with current init. And you should specify a different seed for each one of them. So ID is the seed in this case, and you should make it have a different seed. Um, Otherwise, each thread is going to generate the same sequence if it starts from the same seed. Um, and you don't want that. Now, I have another kernel to actually generate random numbers when I need them. So, in a given kernel, you have this vector of states, and these results are just going to be these um, tallies of you know, how many odd pseudo-random ints did we generate. And what I'm going to do in this kernel is I'm first going to copy each ID's state. So, so ID is the current thread, and the corresponding state is going to be copied into local memory just for efficiency's sake. And I'm going to loop through, and in each iteration of the loop, I'm going to generate a different pseudorandom number. Now I pass, the current is going to do that, and I pass in the local state by reference because Kurand needs to update the state. If Kurand didn't update your number state but kept sampling random numbers, then because the state doesn't change, then the state wouldn't change and you would be sampling the same random number over and over and over again. And that's not actually, that's not even close to random, it's constant. So that's why the local state is passed by reference. The local state gets updated, therefore we move along the random number sequence. For each number I, that I generate, I check if it's odd with this bitwise and, and I update the count of odd things. After I'm done with that, that's the main part of the kernel, but what if I want to do more kernel calls? I better make sure I update this, this original state that I had with the local state that I had in local memory. I'd better make sure I do this, otherwise the next kernel call is going to 
generate the exact same sequence of pseudo random numbers. And for, but what I want is I want each kernel call to have its own separate sequence of pseudo random numbers independently of the previous sequence. So I'm going to copy this local state, which is updated based on my work up here, back to my state array in global memory, and I'm going to return the results. So the results just just keep a tally of how many odd ints I saw in this current kernel call, and it just adds it's, it sits in global memory and it adds up the results for all of the kernel calls that we do. So now the main function. This is, this is what's happening at the top level. So I have some results and some states. Kuran state is the, is the type of the generator. I allocate space for the results on the host and the device. I set the results to I set these counters to zero because because dev results are counters they count how many odd numbers we see so I use CUDA memset to set all 64 times 64 of them to zero to start I allocate space for the random number generators I forgot to include that in the workflow but whatever you most things, most objects, including random number generators, you can pretty much bet, in my examples, that they're going to be in dynamic memory, so you need to allocate them yourself. You call the setup kernel, which just, again, initializes those random number generator states, and I'm going to call this generate kernel 10 times with some states, and I keep track of those states in, in each kernel call, each kernel call is going to modify those random number generator states as we saw before so that we keep moving along that pseudo random sequence in each thread. I'm using 64, 64 blocks and 64 threads per block. And I'm keeping track of these counters, these counters of how many odd numbers we see. And after I do those kernels, I copy the results back. I take the host results and I just add them up and divide by the total number of pseudo-random floats I drew. Block, 64 threads per block, 100,000 iterations in the loop per kernel, and 10 kernel calls. And I print, print out the fraction that are odd. And then I clean everything up. I call CUDA free, and then I call free. Notice there's no, in the device interface, there's no option to just destroy the generator. There's no wrapper function that says, you know, curand destroy or something that, that was in the um, host interface. You have to take those states and free them. And that's how you free the random number generators. You just, you just free those states. These curand states you can think of as the actual generators in the device interface. Just to show that this works, I run this, I compile this thing, remember that curand flag, I run it, and I get about 50% odd, which is good because we were just generating floats uniformly at random. Um, because the curand function that I was using just generates uniformly random bits. Now notice this warning that the double isn't supported, demoting the float. Um, this, be, this is because I didn't specify compute capability and the hardware and software that I was using was so old that it, that it defaulted to compute capability 1. Um, usually you're going to want to use something above 1. I mean, compute capability 1 is really outdated. If you go up to 2 or above, this warning will disappear because doubles are supported in compute capability 2 and above. Um, so, sorry to inflict that on everyone. Rejection sampling on the GPU. Here's an extended example for the device interface, and it's also an example for you statisticians out there of how to call CUDA code from the R language. So what's nice about doing that is you can have your user just be responsible for, for 
this really nice, syntactically nice, um, black boxed R code and have your functions in R call compiled code that was written in C or CUDA C. And so you, you can actually work with this shiny interpreted language, which is R, and R will, under the hood, be using things that are much faster than the native R language. So uh, this is an example on how to do that. And all the code is here. So Dr. Jared Nimi is from Iowa State. He's actually my advisor right now. And he wrote this rejection sampling just to play around. Um, with using random number generation on the GPU. And the idea behind rejection sampling is this. So you draw a pseudorandom number, and if that pseudorandom number is too big, throw it out and go back to step one, and you cycle through these two steps repeatedly until you finally get one that's small enough and you accept it, you return it. This is, this is really accept X. And step two, if x is too big, we say that we reject x. Now, the uh, you may think, you know, if you're not a statistician, you may think, well, why why are we doing this this you know number crunching? Well, it turns out that this is a good way to sample from distributions that are otherwise difficult to sample from. So you know how to we know how to sample from a normal distribution. Mercene Twister is a good example of an algorithm that does that. We know how to sample from a normal distribution. It's a box molar transform of uniform of two uniform draws, and there are other ways to sample from normal distributions besides the box molar transform. You know, even exponential distributions use the probability integral transform to get uniform random numbers to exponentially distributed random numbers, but you know, for really crazy distributions that don't e that don't have um, that that don't even have a name, it's it's it can be difficult to sample from those. And rejection sampling ensures that, say, you know, you can you can sample from those distributions. The idea is that the you can initially draw pseudorandom numbers from some distribution that you know. Say, a normal distribution is often the case. And even though you're actually generating these 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 normal distrib normally distributed numbers, these rejections in step two are such that all the numbers that you return will follow the distribution that you want. The, they will no longer be normal. Say if you use normal distribution in step one, by step three, if you put all those together and plot them, you realize that they'll have um, a different distribution. They'll have the distribution that you want. And the key to, to doing that is, you know, what do you mean by x is too big? The upper bound on x for this condition will determine what distribution you'll end up with here. Um, and there are better ways to explain rejection sampling, but this is all you need to know for now. So, here's, before we jump into the code actually, let me just say that this this GPU rejection sampling is a, is a little sort of comparison study between a rejection sampling algorithm implemented in basic C, um, not basic, I meant uh, isn't basic the language, it's implemented in pure run-of-the-mill C, the same algorithm implemented in parallel in CUDA C, and then the same algorithm implemented in R, and it takes all those and runs them and compares them. So the algorithm is is here inside the CPU R unif function. So we're going to loop through a bunch of times and we are going to go to this while loop here. And this while loop is really the the heart of the rejection sampling um, algorithm here. So you're going to generate a uniform random number and if it's too big, if it's greater than this upper bound, you're going to do it again. These two lines down here just make, are just simulated computational overhead designed specifically to make this thing take a long time. Um, and as you're doing this, you're counting the number of steps in the while loop you're using, and that's the number of rejections. 
in this algorithm. Now, this is implemented in C. I said that I wanted to call this compiled code from R, right? So in order to do that, I need to put this inside a wrapper because if you're calling C from R, you need to make sure those, those C functions that you call return void and take all pointer arguments. So all these arguments are pointers. Um, if I do that, then I can compile this code and there are ways to call this function from R. Now we do the same thing on the GPU except that I'm using the device interface of QRAND so I'm gonna set up a bunch of random number generator states and do this in parallel and I get one state per thread I get one random number generator per thread so when I go to this QRAND kernel here, this RUNIF kernel what I'm doing is I'm doing this rejection sampler and instead of that loop before you can think of each thread as an iteration in that loop. So each thread does goes through one Y loop in this rejection sampler. And again, I need to I need to uh, these are just kernels. I need to package this up in a way so that I can run it in R. So my wrapper this GPU R unif is a wrapper that takes those kernels together, allocates the memory and cleans it up and runs the kernels in a way that um, can be packaged and used. Um, I should mention a couple details here. This extern C is important for anything that you're going to call an R that's written in CUDA because CUDA is not actually just CUDA C. It's CUDA C slash C++. There's a lot of C++ functionality in CUDA and R doesn't really know how to deal with C++ except if you're using a package like RCPP. So the native uh, native R doesn't understand C++, but it does understand C. So you use this extern C a block, and you put that wrapper inside of the extern C block in order to tell R, hey, this is written in pure C. Don't worry about all the C++ nonsense. This, just interpret this as a C function. Um, so that's what extern C does. Again, I'm returning void. I have all pointer arguments. And last point on this is in case you're wondering about C util safe call, that just that's just a, a function to make sure CUDA malloc and CUDA free and other calls to CUDA like CUDA mem copy, making sure all those execute um, without error. I highly recommend that you that you grab the errors of all of these CUDA functions and check them, print them out just in case something's not working, because a lot of this stuff is hardware dependent. You may be using up too much memory without knowing it. Makes thing makes your life a whole lot easier if you put uh, error catching wrapper functions around all of your all of your CUDA functions. Anyway, so this is what the top level in R looks like. You can so my unif is just this function in R that does any given rejection sampler you tell it to. So there's a version for R, there's a version for C, and then there's a GPU version, and you can select which version, and the switch statement is just a control flow statement, uh, just a, a flow control. I always get the, the term, you know, is a flow control or control flow. I, I get them mixed up all the time, but in any case, this is a switch statement like any other switch statement in, in another language. It's, you know, depending on the value of engine. Anyway, so you have this exact, for the R version, you have this exact rejection sampler implemented in R. For C, you use the dot C function in R to call the CPU unif wrap. And CPU unif wrap, remember, is implemented in C. And the string argument is the name of that C function. And in order to run this, you have to compile the C code, but once you do it and it's in the right compiled form, you can call this function with dot C and pass it in these arrays and you have to force them to be the right types with as integer or as double or if you're using flow to use as single and then you can call that function. 
and this returns a list of, of all of the all of the original arguments that you give it. Um, and they should have been modified in the program because you're passing by reference, you're passing in pointers. For the GPU implementation, it's the same thing. GPU RUNIF is compiled and you pass it a bunch of arguments and you return them. So, in this package of code, there's a make file in here that compiles everything. This creates the dynamic objects that you, the dynamic compiled objects, the .so files, the dynamically linked libraries that you need to run this thing in R. So what R is doing when it calls the .c is it looks for the right dynamic, dynamically linked library and it pulls these functions from that and calls them. And in order to do that, you need to compile the C and CUDA C code in the right in the right way. And it's easiest to do this actually instead of calling the make file inside. It's easy to just write this as an R package, and the R package format will allow you to um, automatically compile these things in the right way when you install the R package. Um, I write. CUDA code in R package form nowadays because it's the most convenient interface for me and it's you know a good way to um, have compilation mostly taken care of um, given the right make file. You have to specify make file for CUDA functions but R packages make your life make my life easier and make it should make your life easier if you're comfortable with R. Now inside this this repo, this GPU rejection sampling repo that Dr. Niemi wrote, you can find a bunch of files. I recommend going to the demo once you have everything compiled and running this comparison.r. It'll generate a bunch of output and a bunch of plots. And the most useful one here, I think, is to look at the speed up. So CPU time over GPU time uh, compares the speed up of an operation that you get by parallelizing things on the GPU. And you have, so the speed up on the x-axis, a number of accepted samples here, that's sort of, that's part of the demand, the workflow in the, of, on, the, on the amount of work um, that the computer does in this case. Um, and then you have a bunch of different other things that you vary, a bunch of other covariates that you can look at, like the acceptance probability, and the number of double operations and integer operations. These two were the busy work, part of the workflow used to artificially slow things down within each step. And as you can see, parallelism gives you the most advantage if, I mean, for low acceptance probabilities. You get more of a speed up, GPU versus CPU speed up, if you have low acceptance probabilities. Um, in, this, in this case, that turns out to help. And that's it. That's everything in the Kurand uh, talk. You can refer to the guide for more details. This is more up-to-date information. I used a really old version of Kurand to, to stay consistent with the rest of the talks. And then the code from today is on the website. And there are links here in the slides. Um, for the host API and device API example, and then the whole folder with all the rejection sampling code is online through GitHub in this link. There was another link in, the, in a previous slide. And that's it. Everything, including this talk, is available on this website as usual. My website has these slides and a video of this screencast soon to have audio as well. This is a second attempt at the video and example code is up there. Thanks for listening.